right. Hello, people. Uh, happy Friday. I'm Zach. Uh, again, like Chaoya, I work with UA, uh, Quasars, AGN, variability, all that good stuff. I'll be uh, slightly shifting the focus of this, but thanks to Chaoya, I won't have to delve too much into the, uh, the introduction, and I think I'll have time to talk about two of my projects here. So I'll be focusing on uh, variability with uh, super long time series data uh, in the optical for a bunch of AGN, 20 years worth. Uh, so here's just the layout. I'll go into a bit of an introduction. I'll talk about my first uh, work that I was doing on these 20 year long light curves. And then I should have enough time definitely to uh, talk about this second project, which is kind of related on optical variability. Um, so introduction, I don't really need to introduce this too much. Uh, like Chaoyu talked about, there's a big unified model. Let's get that mouse out of there. Uh, for AGN and all the structure that's going on that can explain the, excuse me, the observations we have. Uh, the part I'm going to be focusing on is the optical, mainly the accretion disk, whereas Chaoyu is focusing more on the uh, broadline region. Um, and another part that I want to focus on, different from Chaoyu, where uh, I, I just, I'm focused more so on why we observe the variability we observe, not how it propagates throughout the, the system to describe sort of length scales and time scales within it, why we're observing the variability. And in this case, it's related to the accretion disk. What sort of accretion disk physics uh, can we uh, extract from this variability data? Uh, and we can see that on a bunch of different time scales and a bunch of different bands, AGN varies stochastically. Here's some optical data, here's some x-ray data, they all vary. Um, but there's not really a solid single reason why. There's a bunch of different physical models, and of course this differs, dif this differs from part to part. Uh, variability in the BLR could stem from different processes than variability in the uh, inner emitting regions or the accretion disk or even the dusty torus. Uh, so the focus of my research here is why we observe such optical variability in the accretion disk and if we can relate it physically uh, to what's going on in there. Um, so I'll start. Uh, so the way in which we do this is we get our time series data, we fit it to some sort of statistical or physically motivated model and extract some parameters. Uh, mainly time scale data, but also amplitudes if you're interested. So we really want to know if there's any connection between the time scales of the variability in the optical with time scales in the accretion disk, or if there is some sort of physics uh, related to that time scale. Uh, so here's just an example fit of one of the objects in our sample with these 20 year long light curves. Uh, this is a Gaussian process. Uh, and we extract some parameters and we can recon uh, reconstruct the uh, power spectrum there. Um, and the real reason we want to extract these time scales, one is to see if they're accurate, uh, if we can accurately describe these uh, time series data with the models we're using, and two, we want to try and relate these uh, time scales to physics within the system. So this is a work recently done by Colin Burke, who used to be here in the art department, uh, relate, correlating the uh, damping time scale or characteristic variability time scale with black hole mass, and there's a pretty good relation across uh, a bunch of orders of magnitude. Um, we need a larger sample to actually verify this, but it, it's a pretty good relation. Uh, however, there's a, a lot of problems with how we get these time scales from the variability data. Uh, there's only a few models used, really, in optical variability analysis from AGN. Uh, and as we get higher quality and longer uh, baseline data, we need to assess if these uh, time scales we're extracting from these models are biased. Or if they are biased, how biased are they? Are there certain regimes where they're not? And are there better models that we can use to describe the variability and hence infer what's going on in the uh, accretion disk? Uh, and it turns out uh, the one model, or this is, this is the one popular model that's used anyway for optical variability modeling, the damped random walk model, has some issues which we'll go into in the future, but uh, I'll just talk a bit about the model here. It's very simple. You can characterize it by its PSD here. Uh, it's got this uh, white noise section at low frequencies, and after a certain characteristic break related to the time scale tau, it falls off as red noise or frequency to the minus two. And it only has two parameters, the time scale and this uh, uh, amplitude sigma. Uh, and it's used in a bunch of different models and softwares, uh, reverberation mapping software here, and also dynamical modeling software here. Uh, but since it's used so much, how valid is it? And are there any problems with it? Uh, well, there are a bunch of problems uh, with the DRW, which has been uh, springing up in recent years. Uh, but one of the main problems is bias in the extracted parameters uh, that we're 
that we're getting. So uh, this is another plot by Colin showing uh, the input um, tau parameter against the recovered tau parameter. And uh, th this is just a way to um, present it here where it's the tau parameter over the length of the light curve. And we can see that as uh, if, if the tau parameter is too large relative to the length of the light curve, or we're not sampling this time scale properly, the recovered tau parameter uh, is biased to around 20% of the baseline of the light curve you're observing. Um, so no matter what time scale is generating your light curve, you're always going to recover around 20% of the baseline with a lot of scatter here. Uh, so the gist of this is the longer the light curve you have, so the higher the baseline, the lower this row parameter is, you're in this regime, the less the, uh, the, less the bias is in your recovered tau parameter. Uh, so we want to see if we're in this regime or not after 20 years of data, uh, because hopefully we'd have the least biased results possible, so we'd be able to have the most accurate representation of what's going on in the accretion disk. Um, so that's what we decided to do. We had this sample of around 200 quasars from uh, SDSS, uh, 20 years of data spanning SDSS, PanSTARS, and Dark Energy Survey uh, over 20 years. Uh, and we wanted to see if we fit these all to a damped random walk model, got those parameters out, are they still biased or not? And if they are, how bad is it? And is there something that works better? Here are just some statistics of the sample, uh, nothing too crazy. We see it fits the general quasar population from Sloan, which is the contours in black. Um, so we fit each of these light curves, GR and I, for each of the quasars uh, to a DRW, extracted the parameters, and this is what we got. So this top plot shows uh, the extracted parameters as a function of baseline. So we truncated the baseline to only the Sloan data, fit it, then we added the PanSTARS data, fit it, then we added the DS data, fit that. And we find that as we increase the baseline, so we go from red to black to blue, um, the tau parameter and also the sigma parameter, because there's kind of a degeneracy there, still increase. So this suggests that our results are still biased. Um, at least somewhat, because if they weren't biased, then they'd be constant even if we increase the baseline. However, uh, the scatter and uncertainty uh, in these parameters decrease a little bit. We can see that it kind of tightens as we increase the baseline, but it's not very significant. So we still need longer baselines even after 20 years to get accurate uh, timescale parameters uh, and accurately parameterize the, uh, the, uh, the variability in the optical. However, is there a way, oh, actually, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. We also tried to see if we could um, confirm uh, relations from previous studies, because their results were obviously biased if they're only using 10 years of AGN data, and we recover similar um, correlations to, the, in this case, its rest wavelength um, and the uh, DRW parameters. But seeing as our results are still biased, is there a regime in which they're not biased, and uh, is there another model that could fit this better? Uh, so what we do to try and uh, investigate this is we fit all of our light curves to a more flexible karma model, which is actually a generalization of the DRW model. So here we have uh, the power spectrum fits to one light curve using the two different models. The black is the DRW, and the blue is the karma. It's much more flexible in its shape. DRW has to be straight, this can curve. Uh, and we also see it doesn't have to follow this uh, frequency to the minus two slope. So we fit all of our light curves to a karma model, uh, the best, uh, the max probability one, uh, and then uh, we compare the karma model power spectra to these DRW power spectra uh, to see uh, if they match at any points um, and if there's any bias there. Uh, in particular, we perform ensemble PSD analysis to get uh, analysis uh, variability of variability as a whole instead of doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so here's the first result. So these are the ensemble or averaged PSDs from the entire ensemble um, in the GRNI bands. Uh, we can see there is some sort of turnover here that resembles the DRW. It follows kind of a frequency to the minus two at uh, intermediate frequencies, but then quickly steepens to around frequency to the minus four at higher frequencies. So we can already tell it's differing from a DRW in that way. So it's obvious that there, there's, uh, the DRW is not the best at describing variability. Um, the best way to see this is we split our sample up by the tau parameter here, 
Uh, this just means we're splitting it up by bias because the uh, shortest recovered tau parameter would be the least biased part of our sample. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When you say the ensemble power spectrum, yeah. is this across all of the AGN or across one AGN but the different data sets? This is across all AGN. Why do you expect the power spectrum to have any useful information across all the AGN? Why, why is that the assumption that the physics is exactly the same? Uh, for each of the um, AGN, you mean? Yeah, I, I, I think, so we're, we're just trying to get close to, because you're assuming that there's one given model for the accretion disk for every AGN, right? Just a simplifying assumption, right? Uh, I think if you were to do it on a case-by-case -case basis or split it up between, you know, like high editing ratio AGN, low editing ratio AGN, you could get different results for this ensemble PSD. But we're just trying to get a general look at this because I mean, it seems a little bit strange just given the previous talk was about high exactly, accretion rate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's because we don't know if this model works well enough yet to be able to say that we can describe these different uh, types of AGN with this one model. So we're just trying to see what's going on, basically, if that makes sense. Um, sure. Uh, so we, what was I saying? So we split our sample up by basically bias this is the least biased part of our sample, and we compared the karma and the DRW results, and we can see that they match fairly well uh, near this turnover, which is good, and also sort of in these intermediate frequencies, they overlap. But as we get to higher frequencies, this sort of steepens. It dips down faster or quicker than a DRW. So we know that the DRW matches uh, the truer variability well on these intermediate timescales, sort of months, but on these um, very short timescales, it doesn't. Um, and there has been a lot of different studies suggesting that there's a second break time scale here, which leads to this steepening behavior. So to try and investigate this further, uh, we fit all of these ensemble PSDs to a doubly broken power law to try and get some time scale information. And we found that one is uh, relatively similar to this damping time scale from the DRW. The second one is on the order of tens of days instead of hundreds of days. Uh, and they both scale with each other along with the uh, DRW time scale. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what this time scale is. We're not really sure about this. Um, it's, it's hard to connect this to physics or if it's just sort of some sort of problem with our, uh, with our model. Uh, but I think with more data from LSST, higher quality data sets, uh, and higher sampling rates, uh, we'd be able to sample this uh, lower part of the PSD more to kind of find out what's going on uh, and compare it to uh, theoretical models. Um, so that's the uh, gist of the first paper. I guess if you have any questions about that, I'll take them from here. Yeah. Are you using DDS still? No, we're only using Sloan, Panstars, and DES. So maybe DTF on that time scale? Yes. I mean, not I, I, we haven't tried doing that yet. Uh, I think it would be interesting to see if that would work. Uh, I don't know if the noisiness would help down there as well. Right, but it would be interesting to try. I'll also quickly add, you know, Illinois institutional member in Yeezy, you have access to three more years of Fanstars data, or at least some of these. Okay, let's do it then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll run it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, uh, sure. Okay, there's no other questions. I'll move to the second uh, work I'll be talking about here. Um, so this also banks off of something Chayu was talking about. Uh, she mentioned this in the reverberation mapping context. I'll just call it the lamppost model, where you have this continuum uh, radiation spewing out from the center, uh, being absorbed further out within the AGN, and then being re-emitted after a certain characteristic time scale based off the distance uh, scale within the AGN. And this is assumed in a lot of optical uh, variability study as well. So you don't have to just do this for BLR. Uh, variability, you can also do this for accretion disk variability to get sort of the size of the accretion disk um, or time scales within the accretion disk. However, there are a lot of problems with the lamppost model in accretion disk reverberation mapping uh, study. So the first off, if you do this, a lot of papers predict uh, sizes of the accretion disk that are too large physically 
when comparing to theoretical models. Second, uh, there is evidence for inflowing signals. Of course, if it's the lamppost model, you'd only see these outgoing signals, but there's evidence of negative time lags. Uh, and third, there are evidence for signals slower than predicted by the lamppost model, because these would be very quick, moving around the speed of light, but some predict around 10% or less of the speed of light. So how can we resolve uh, these issues without assuming the lamppost model in our analysis? Because most of the analysis done assumes this. Uh, well, this is where this paper, Neustadt and Kachanik, comes in. Uh, about a year and a half ago, they came up with this model slash method, uh, this physically motivated model, where uh, temperature fluctuations within the accretion disk generate flux variability within the spectra and the light curves we observe. So their method basically takes a bunch of multi-wavelength uh, light curves, or I guess if you flip it, multi-epoch spectra, and output a temperature fluctuation map or a temperature map is what I'll call it. So this is an example of one with lamppost-like signals. Time's on the bottom, radius is on the left. It's log space radius, so it looks kind of weird. But you can see that these fluctuations move quickly outward over time. Uh, this is sort of like a wave uh, moving outward over time. Um, here's an example temperature map where you can kind of see the direct uh, relation between these temperature fluctuations and the moving um, flux variability in the spectrum. You see this peak moves outward in the disk, and it also moves towards longer wavelengths, and vice versa, this dip moves inward towards shorter wavelengths as it moves inward in the disk. Uh, this is the same uh, example temperature map uh, in, in the ones I'll be presenting here. It's the input. These are all the output. You can choose a different smoothing parameter for your output, uh, depending on how smooth you want your output to be, um, or else it gets very noisy here. Um, so Neustadt and Kachanik had a sample of about 10 local AGN, uh, and they found this. So they saw that there was complex radial motion uh, counter to the lamppost model. Uh, normally, you'd see these very like uh, vertical stripes if it was the lamppost model, like here, but they don't see that. They see a lot of noise and some semblance of inward moving signals that they trace here. Uh, in this case, there's also sort of wandering fluctuations that move up and down throughout the disk. Um, so it's very complicated what's going on here. Uh, it's also very qualitative. It's hard to get sort of quantitative analysis of this. But you can tell it's, it's definitely not only lamppost. So to verify this, we expanded the sample uh, to a larger parameter space using uh, Sloan quasars, in particular the SDSS RM sample, 100 of the most variable quasars in those. Uh, we expanded to a higher redshift uh, and uh, higher uh, black hole mass and luminosity space. So we put all these through the model, um, and this is what we found. Um, so here are three example uh, outputs from the model. Um, and the general consensus among all of the, uh, all of the quasars is that none of them show any sign of lamppost-like signals. Um, there are these stripes in the data those are just systematic effects from the, the model itself, uh, so it's kind of hard to tell. But there are some sort of semblances of uh, ingoing and outgoing slow-moving perturbations. You can hear, see here on the right, there's some wandering perturbations as well. Um, it's, it's very hard to do this qu uh, quantitatively, quantitatively, uh, yeah. Um, there are also some systematic effects with poor resolution, so it's even harder. But you can definitely tell there's none of these uh, solid stripes moving upward and downward uh, in these temperature maps. Um, and when you try and quantify it a little bit with these lines, you get on average a slower velocity and a period of around 50 days, which you can try and relate to some time scale in some way within the accretion disk. Um, I guess I'm a bit short here, but uh, if you have any questions, thank you. <laughs> So on the previous slide, um, the with the the graphs that you have with the red and the blue, yeah. um, I I feel like I've I've I don't know if I heard you say this today, but I definitely have heard you say before. I think that the factor that is changing as we move in each of the plots from left to right is a smoothing factor. Do yes. I remember that correctly? So yes. I'm a little bit 
confused by the smoothing factor. It, it, d can I take that to mean that on the left is the most like literal of what the data is, and then as you move right, it's just supposed to bring out features visually? Right, so the th that is pretty much right. Uh, the, the smoothing factor basically, uh, if you have a smoothing factor of one, uh, your chi-squared is gonna be very low. And as you increase the smoothing factor to get more smooth variations, in your data, it decreases the chi-squared. So it's very jumpy and jittery here uh, with this low smoothing factor, but as you increase it, it gets smoother. And so do you, do you have a, a quantification of how confident the features at a smoothing factor of 10 to the fourth are real? So <laughs> if you increase the smoothing factor too much, it just becomes nonsense, right? Uh, if you can still see the signals across the smoothing factor, it, it probably means they're real. You can tell this with the tests we were doing beforehand with the model where you input a simulated temperature map and out uh, and extract it afterward. And 10 to the 4 works for these simulated test cases as well. So uh, we're pretty sure these are real. Yeah. Uh, very cool talk, Zach. I'm just curious. Um, you write here that there's no evidence of lamppost signals, but how much of that has to do with maybe just a high of sample as things are like lower resolution? Oh, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So there is the possibility that uh, there is a really long period lamppost signal underneath all of this, but we can't capture it uh, because we're only looking at, you know, 100 days rest frame time. So that's definitely possible because if it's like, if there's a period of like, I don't know, 300 days of the lamppost signal or something, and its amplitude is very, very low, we wouldn't be able to see it here. Because the, the main gist of this is that the internal stresses in the accretion disk dominate these temperature fluctuations, more so than the lamppost signal. So there could be lamppost signal within this, but it's not the dominant mechanism for the variability we're observing. So in the lamppost model, right, the origin of the signal comes from the center and then goes out. Yeah. In the temperature fluctuation model, do you have a sense for where those temperature fluctuations originate in the disk or if there's like two or three subsets like where in the disk and like why? In, yeah, in so of the disk? where in the disk you'd be able to tell from here uh, just radially. Like if you could resolve it highly enough and right. it weren't so noisy, you'd be able to do that. I, this is very agnostic of accretion disk theory. The, the only thing we put in here is the, um, a steady state temperature, mm -hmm. uh, radially symmetric in the, uh, uh, in the accretion disk. And even that, it doesn't really matter. It just has to be smooth. So I, I think it's kind of agnostic of the theory. But as to what is causing it, it could be some instability within the accretion disk, some sort of viscous instability that's causing the fluctuations. That's what Colin uh, mentioned within his paper showing that correlation between the damping time scale sure. and the black hole mass. It could be some sort of viscous time scale. Uh, there's a bunch of different instabilities that could lead to it. It's, it's just very uncertain because it's all very qualitative. Cool, thanks. So, part and version of a question I guess Charles asked you on the field. Uh, if you have to make this more quantitative, there's two possible approaches. Yeah. One is actually modeling things with different time scale kernels right. and seeing what the power is. Mm -hmm. The other is potentially injection tests. So, right. what sort of next on your radar? For, yeah, for this, I think you'd, you'd want to do the injection test, definitely, because uh, I was at a conference in Italy, and uh, Yan Fei Zhang, who's doing um, accretion disk simulations at Flatiron, uh, actually produced one of these plots. Um, so it'd be interesting to compare these to simulated results to see if there's anything similar. I tried to before, but your eyes get tired after 20 hours of looking through these. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it, you'd also want to try and inject, like you said, some sort of simulated data within this next. So I think once the simulated data from Flatiron comes out, I'd want to try and compare this or inject it. 